before we talk, start talking about um, digital images, right, which is really the, func the whole point of this course, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how do you see, how do humans perceive images in the natural world, and uh, how does color work, and some things about human perception, right? So some of this is not really like super germane to the kinds of image processing we're going to do later, but I think it's actually pretty interesting, and you know, maybe it's a throwback to kind of like high school biology where you learn about uh, the anatomy of your eye and stuff like that. So let's, let's start with this uh, picture here. So this is a picture of your eye, right? And so um, let's just kind of take a look at some of these things, right? So here you got your, um, let me draw a line here. So the main components of the eye. So you got your cornea, right? The cornea is the clear part that goes over all the rest of this stuff. Um, it's transparent. And um, then behind that, you have your iris, right? So the iris is, the front of the iris is the part that gives your eye the color, OK? And so the iris can contract or expand to control how much light gets into the eye, right? So that's kind of like the aperture of your eye. Then behind that, you have the lens, right? So the lens is this kind of um, you know, hard, but also kind of like jelly-like blob of material that focuses the light onto the back of the retina. Okay, and so if your lens starts to get cloudy, that's what causes cataracts when you get older. Okay, so light comes through the cornea. It's you know goes through the hole that's defined by the iris. It goes through the lens, and then it hits the retina at the back of the eye. And so the retina is where all of the light-sensitive cells are. Okay, and this basically lines the back of the eye. This is where all these rods and cones are. We're going to talk about those a little bit more a little bit later in the lecture. And then there's this one special part of the retina called the fovea, OK? So the fovea is basically the central part of the retina. And this is where the highest concentration of cones, or color-sensitive cells, live, OK? And so in some sense, that's the only part of the eye that defines for you what seems to be in focus, OK? So you certainly you notice that you know, it's very hard for you to quantify inside your own head, right? But if you you know, look around, right? There's a part that's in focus, and then kind of your peripheral vision is kind of fuzzy, right? So the fovea is responsible for everything that seems to you at any given time to be in focus, OK? Then behind there is the optic nerve, right? And the optic nerve is this bundle of stuff that carries all the signals from the rods and the cones back to the brain, OK? And actually, there are no rods and cones at all where the optic nerve connects to the eye, right? So it's actually, uh, suck. There's actually a, um, a region of the retina that has no photosensitive cells, and that's called the blind spot, right? So, and that's something that's kind of really freaky in some sense, is that there's a, you know, behind each of one of your eyes, there's a whole missing chunk of retina that is actually getting no sensory input, and your brain is filling in what should be happening in that empty region, right? So you've probably seen some, like, web demonstrations. If I find some good ones, I'll put them on Piazza, where you can kind of you can kind of demonstrate this effect, right? Where there's something that you can kind of focus on one thing, and they put something blinking in your blind spot, and you can't actually perceive it, which is really freaky. Okay. So the um, the interesting thing, like I said, is that the uh, fovea is kind of where all the action happens. And so if we look on the next page here, so this is a graph of the concentration of rods and cones at different angles with respect to where the kind of optical axis is. So as light comes directly into your eye, that's zero degrees. Or actually, I guess as light comes into your eye, you can see from this picture that it, it basically comes straight back and hits, you know, yeah. Basically comes straight back and hits the fovea, which I would like to draw, but I am seem to be having a bad Adobe day, right? So it kind of comes straight through and hits here, right? And so. If you look at the concentration of cells in those regions, right? So the blue line is the cones, which are the color-sensitive cells. And the rods are basically light-sensitive, but not color-sensitive. So that's what's responsible for stuff like your night vision, OK? So you can see, first of all, there's this blind spot where there's no rods and cones at all, right? And then you can see that in the, you know, right at the fovea, there's like a super concentration of cones, right, the color-sensitive cells which drops off drastically as you move away from the fovea on the back of the retina. Um, and kind of by the same token, there aren't that many rods inside the fovea, but there are lots of rods outside, OK? 
And so it's interesting to think about you know, some of the statistics. So apparently, the phobia is um, about 1.5 millimeters on a side. Right? Think about how small that is, right? And that tiny, tiny you know, piece of tissue is responsible for all of your kind of perception of the visual world, right? Not only that, there are only about 350,000 kind of individually addressable, you know, it would, be, it would be wrong to call them pixels. Let's just call them, you know, uh, color sensitive receptors. Right? So that means that all that, you know, visual information is packed into 350,000, you know, kind of pixels in your eye. And if you think about that, that number of, of pixels is much, much lower than even the crappiest digital camera that you can find these days, right? Yet your perception of the world seems so much richer than any digital image, right? And so that is kind of a testament to how much other stuff there is going on inside your head, right? The whole role, you know, it's not like just that your eye is a sensor that you point into the world and it's automatically mapped directly into your, you know, perception. There's this whole filtering of your brain in this whole process that uses, you know, past experience of things it saw, you know, understanding of how things should be, it kind of hallucinates things that it doesn't actually perceive. So once you start to kind of think about uh, the whole physical process, it's pretty freaky, right? Because there really isn't that much visual information in terms of like raw bits coming into your retina, but you're able to have this rich visual experience. And so the way that your eye basically works is not that different from, you know, not that different from a camera in some senses, right? So, you know, you have your eye. And so let's see, here's your cornea. And here's your lens, right? And here's your retina. And so fundamentally, light is traveling through the lens and hitting the back of the retina. And so, you know, in terms of what the retina is actually responding to, you know, there's going to be this little upside down image of everything in the world projected on the retina that your brain automatically flips to be the right side up when you think about it, right? So, um, but this is not really exactly the same as, a, as the way a camera works. So for example, it's true that a camera has a way of changing the aperture that's similar to what your iris does. But one thing that a physical camera does that your eyes don't do is that, you know, if you have a good like DSLR camera, for example, and you have a various, a very focal lens, right? When you turn the ring, you're actually physically moving the distance between the, uh, between the CCD and the camera and the hole where the light goes through, right? So you're actually moving stuff around back and forth. So your, your eye can't move your iris back and forth with respect to the retina. That, that distance is fixed. So instead what happens is that your lens actually, you know, it's not like a, a hard lens like a piece of glass in the camera. That lens actually uh, physically changes shape and distorts you know, it flattens or it thickens inside your eye so that, you know, the difference between looking at this piece of paper and suddenly looking back at the room and focusing on that sign is my lens and my eye changing shape, right? So the whole system is, is pretty amazing. Okay, so another way in which our human visual system is much better than a camera is the way that it can perceive brightness, okay? So... So we can adjust our eyes to a huge range of kind of ambient uh, light intensity levels, right? So basically, uh, the eye has a huge dynamic range. On the order of kind of 10 to the 10th, you know, difference between the darkest thing that you can perceive and the lightest thing you can perceive, right? And you know, subjective brightness, this is the kind of thing that's interesting. So there's basically some sense of the, um, you know, there's a sense of how bright something actually is in terms of a physical unit that you could measure with a objective device and how brightly you perceive it as a human, right? So the subjective brightness is, you know, basically logarithmic. 
as a function of intensity. Now, you can't perceive this whole massive range simultaneously, right? So for example, if you're in a super bright room, you can't perceive details in the shadows, right? But your eye can adapt to kind of the conditions that it's in, right? So for example, you know, if you're in a darkened room for, you know, say half an hour, suddenly you're able to perceive kind of, you know, shadows and, and shapes that are, you know, actually very low intensity in terms of the actual physical photons getting into your eye, right? That's at the low end. At the high end, you know, if you were to squint, you can kind of let in, you know, you can even see what's happening in a very, very bright, like a super sunny day, right, for example. It's much, much brighter than a darkened room. And so this kind of process of changing the um, perception is called brightness adaptation. So that just means that the iris, you know, opens or closes to let in or restrict the, uh, the amount of light. Okay. And so there have been a lot of very cool psychophysical experiments in terms of how humans perceive uh, light. Okay. And one of, the re one of the classic ones is basically um, the following. So you take a kind of a uniform intensity, like a uniform gray rectangle, and the middle of it, so let's suppose that it has intensity I, okay? And the middle of it, you put a circle that is a little bit different from I, right? So it's not quite the same intensity, it's I plus some change, right? And then you flicker this middle light on and off, right? And then you ask the subject, at what point does it seem like this image is just a steady image, right? So there's some point where below delta i, you perceive this image as being just a constant level of i, right? But, you know, if your perception is good, then you can perceive there's a difference in the flickering light, right? And so this is sometimes called the just noticeable difference. You basically run the experiment until you can no longer see the flickering. And so this delta i is like the perceptible threshold. And if you were to make a plot of how people actually respond to this, kind of what you see is the following. So here is the log of the intensity, right? So the brighter the light is, the more off to the right we are here. And here on this axis is the log of delta i over i, right? This is called the Weber ratio. So this is kind of like a measurement of the percentage of the original intensity that delta i has to be for us to not notice a difference, right? And so that, that kind of looks something like this. So when things are in the dark, you know, this percentage can be fairly high, right? Basically meaning that it's hard for you to distinguish, um, you know, serious change of intensity if you're in a dark room, right? If you're in a bright room, so this is basically the action of the rods, which are the non-color sensitive ones. And if you're in a bright room, your cones start to take over, and then you're much more easily able to define, like in a room like this, the difference between a white patch and a slightly less white patch, right? So things get better as the room gets brighter, which kind of makes sense. So brightness adaptation is poor in low light, and it's better when you have a brighter background, okay? So this is where it starts to get a little bit freaky, is that it's not like there is just some sort of a, um, you know, one-to-one -one mapping between the intensity that comes into the eye, this function of perceived brightness, and then how you perceive it, right? There's a lot of other kind of interesting psychological stuff going on. And so one of them is called mock bands, right? So I'm not sure how well this is going to work in this room. Let's, let me just turn down the lights here. Unfortunately, some of these demonstrations may not look that great on the screen, but they'll look great on your laptop, for example. So this is basically a um, set of bands that goes from dark to light. And so the Mach band phenomenon is that if you're looking at this at the right distance, the color that is, uh, so these are all solid color blocks, but the idea is that 
your eye should perceive that the right-hand edges of the block are a little bit lighter and the left-hand edges of the block are a little bit darker because of the fact that these things are coming together. Now, I'm just curious. I don't really see it. I can see it on my screen, but I'm wondering whether you guys can see it from the crowd. A little bit. So I think what you should do is go back after the lecture and look at these things on, you know, on a smaller screen. I think that will help. Here's, here, here's another classic one that may be a little bit better, right? So this is a classic optical illusion, right? So the idea is that, you know, which of these two central squares is darker? Most people will say that the right-hand one is darker, but in fact, they're both exactly the same gray level. And your perception of them is affected by um, the fact that this is surrounded, the one on the left is surrounded by black and the one on the right is surrounded by white, right? And here's an even more you know, freaky one, right? So here again, the question is, which of these squares is darker, A or B? And in fact, A and B are exactly the same intensity, right? So here, it's your brain that is thinking, okay, this is in the shadow of this object, and you know you kind of automatically perceive A to be you know much darker than B, right? Whereas if you were to actually use a Photoshop dropper to sample the colors, you would see they're exactly the same. And it gets even worse in terms of color. So in fact, here the central square on the top and the central square on the left are exactly the same color, right? Whereas you would swear that the one on the left is super orange and the one on the top is super brown, right? And so for more on that kind of thing, let me just see where I got here. So for more on that kind of thing, there's um, some cool web pages. So let me just see here. Um, ah, go away, go away. So let's go to Piazza. So I put some links on our Piazza page. And if you go to resources, you'll see couple links at the bottom here. One is optical illusions and one is the third one. So let's take a look at this one. So this page is great. It's definitely worth paging through these things. In particular, after class, you should go and look at some of these luminance and contrasts. So um, here are a couple ones that are like really uh, impressive. So let's see. This is the one we just looked at. Here is a good one. So let's try, I think it's uh, this one. So I don't know whether this works from the back of the room, but this one really bakes your noodle, right? So if you, if you kind of concentrate, if you, if you kind of look at this as a, as, a, as a big picture, it seems like there are these little black dots in the centers of these grids. They're just like your eye is trying to chase them around, right? But they're not actually there, right? There's nothing there. It's just like your eye is trying to fill them in somehow, right? And so it's interesting if you read every one of these web pages has a little psychophysical explanation of kind of why people think that's true. And there's even more, like here's one where the color of the background is changing. And so the, the question is, like, what color do the dots seem to be? So, um, you know, it seems like the dots are black when these kind of streets are red. But if I move this over, now the dots seem to be red. At least they do seem to be to be to be red, right? So it's like, you know, crazy things where the, where the actual physical input to your visual system is kind of unambiguous, but your brain is doing all sorts of stuff. And so, there's a couple other ones I wanted to show you here. Um, so let's see. Here's a good one. So again, this is kind of like the one with the two center blocks I showed you before, right? So here, if you looked at this, you would probably swear that the inner colored circles are changing grayscale intensity. But in fact, they're staying exactly the same. Okay? And your perception of which one is lighter or darker is, is changed by that dynamic motion of the surrounding grayscale, right? And there's an even stronger influence of this, like, for example, um, there's a good color one here. I think it's, is this one? Yeah, so here again, like, you would swear that the right-hand green bar is darker green somehow than the left-hand green bar. But if you move these bars out of the way, you can see that they're actually the same color green, right? And the effect is like very, you know, very strong, right? Uh, and I think there was one more here that I wanted to show you. Um, which one was it? This one. This one's good. So here, the, the, the trick is you're supposed to look at this. And again, this, this may be a little bit... Um, harder for you, for you to perceive because it's my visual system. So I'm looking at the screen and, and the problem is what I want to do is I want to adjust 
the middle bar until it seems like it's constant intensity. So like to me, on my screen, I want to pull this over to be like about here, right? This is where it seems to me that things look constant. And if you turn off the background, you see that actually it was constant to begin with, and I've changed it to something that's not, right? So anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun to play around with some of these things. And on top of that, there's a lot of dynamic, um, well, actually, I, I guess I wouldn't call it dynamic. Here's, here are some very strong illusions from this Japanese website. So none of these are animated GIFs, OK? So like here, there is this extremely compelling feeling that these disks are somehow rotating, right? At least, you know, again, maybe it works better when you're looking at it on a computer screen. I don't know whether you guys can perceive it from the back. But like, again, you kind of try and focus on which one is moving. And every time your eyes move to one, it seems like it stops moving and something else in your peripheral vision is moving. Um, so again, I apologize that these don't work so well in class, but they'll work better when you look at home. Again, here, like, nothing is moving in this image. But if you're looking at it up close, it seems like these rings are somehow counter-rotating. And in fact, all these, you know, it, it seems like things are somehow curved, but all these things are just squares. Um, this is a good one. So there's all these are just squares. There's no curved lines anywhere in this image, right? But it has this very serious feeling like things are bulging out, right? And then I think there's one more good one. So here again, similar thing. Like there's no motion in this image, right? And everything is square. But it seems like there's this like wavy, you know, lines. Every time you look at it, it seems like it's kind of waving around, right? So again, feel free to poke around on these websites to kind of learn a little bit more about um, some of the crazy things that your visual system can do. And so as you can imagine, this makes, um, you know, modeling things in image processing, you know, pretty complicated. Um, so Again, we're not going to deal too much with this in class here, but it's worth understanding that you know it's not just like a turn the crank and you know understand what your what your eye sees. There's a lot of other stuff that is mediated by your brain that's difficult to to model and difficult to even understand why it works. Okay, and one reason that's worth talking about this a little bit, I guess, is that when we talk about image compression in a couple months, you know that's one of the reasons that things like image compression works, right? So image compression is saying, okay. I've got this image, and I've got these RGB pixels that came from my camera, right? And you would think that you can't change those RGB pixels at all to preserve what's in the image. But it turns out that you can change those quite a bit. And as a human, you don't really see where the differences are. And the reason that you don't see those is due to some of these psychophysical phenomena. OK. OK. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, I guess one, one more thing I wanted to say about uh, temporal stuff is um, there's also something called basically the critical fusion frequency. And so those of you that play video games will be familiar with the fact that people are always complaining about video game frame rate, right? They always want it to be 60 frames a second or higher, right? And one of the reasons for that is that, um, you know, your visual system, so imagine that the experiment where you have basically a light that's just blinking on and off at a regular rate, right? At some point, if the light is blinking fast enough, you perceive it as a steady light, OK? And that's exactly the principle behind um, movies, right? So movies are discrete chunks of image shown at you in succession. And there's a black region while the projector goes from one image to the next. But you perceive it as basically a steady image, right? So movies are shown at you know usually something like you know 30 frames per second. Video games, you want your frame rate, since you're maybe up closer, to be more like 60 frames a second. Even some of the fancier LCD and plasma TVs will kind of, um, they will try to upsample the frame rate to be something like 120 or 240 hertz, um, again, to make this kind of smoother experience, right? So again, that's a, that's a thing that is due to the way that your eye perceives light. I mean, if you perceived light that was, you know, turning on and off that fast, then suddenly, you know, movies would be like totally confusing and, and uh, disorienting to you. OK, so let's talk a little bit about uh, light and color. OK, so we talked a little bit last time about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So this is kind of our discussion from last time where you've got gamma rays on the uh, far end and radio waves on the other end. And there's a slice in the middle that corresponds to visible imaging. OK, and that's, again, where we care about you know, for the most part in this class. And so that means that basically from about, uh, you know, 400 to 700 nanometers, you've got the range of visible colors from blue to red, okay? And so blue is at the low end and red is at the high end in terms of wavelength, okay? And so, again, 
there's no, I mean, even though it looks like it on this picture, there's not like there's some abrupt change of colors, like suddenly it's green in this region and blue in this region. There's this kind of continuous color shift from one to the other. And it's interesting, I guess, to note that, you know, it seems like in this picture, there is a lot more blue and red than there is green, right? So again, it's not like the colors are kind of evenly distributed like a rainbow in this, in this electromagnetic spectrum either. So how do we kind of perceive light and color? So basically, you've got emitted radiance. That's kind of like what the light source is emanating, and that's measured in watts. And then you have kind of like the amount of light that um, gets to your eye that's filtered by the human visual system, and that's measured in what's called lumens. And then you have the brightness that you see in your head, which has not got any real physical units. That's just like the human perception, OK? All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, you know, this perceptual process. And so let me go back to rods and cones a little bit. So there are two kinds of light-sensitive cells in the eye, rods and cones, OK? And Let's kind of make a chart here. So I have rods and I have cones. OK, so the rods are um, you know, very sensitive to light intensity. And they're what are responsible for your kind of night vision, or what's called scotopic vision. So anything that you can see in the dark is due to the rods. The cones are only sensitive to direct light. And that's what's called photopic vision. And so again, if you remember, the cones are super concentrated in the fovea, which is the part of the retina that's receiving the direct light, right? There are hardly, you know, the, the, the density of cones drops off a lot in the kind of peripheral regions of your retina, that's because the cones can't do anything with that light. It's not sensitive enough. Whereas the rods are kind of all over your retina. In fact, they're, they're concentrated away from your, your fovea, but they're super sensitive to light. That's why they're back in the other parts of the retina. And so um, basically, the rods are you know, not sensitive to color at all. So I call them achromatic. Whereas the cones are sensitive to color. And as we'll talk about in just a second, you know, they kind of respond to three different colors, okay? So you've got three different kinds of cones, which are kind of coarsely like red, green, blue cones, but not exactly, as we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so the rods, I would say, basically have what's called low acuity, meaning that there are many rods per nerve ending. So the information from many rods at once is getting aggregated and carried along a single nerve, OK? Whereas the cones, the cones are basically concentrated in fovea, and there's one per nerve end, right? So that means you're getting a lot more information from the cones than you are from every single rod. Um, and again, like we talked about, the cones or the rods are responsible for your peripheral vision. And the cones are responsible for your kind of high visual acuity and spatial resolution. And again, if you step back and you think about it, it is kind of freaky, right? Because you definitely are perceiving color. In your, in your peripheral vision, right? The, the rest of the world seems as colored to you at the, sides of the, as the sides of your eyes as they do here. Yet there are very, very few color sensitive cells that are acting for this, right? So again, your brain is kind of filling in what color should this stuff be from very sparse information in your peripheral vision, right? It's, it's pretty crazy. OK, so your rods are slow to respond to light. So even though they're very sensitive, they have a slow response, whereas the cones have a fast response. And again. You kind of notice that when you're in 
uh, a darkened room, right? So it takes some time for your rods to begin to accumulate, you know, to, to acclimate to what's going on in the room. And even then, you're not going to be able to perceive like fast moving objects in a dark room, right? And finally, there are a lot more rods than cones. So there are about 150 million of them, say, in your retina, where there are only about six or seven million over here. OK. So two different kinds of, of nerve cells. So let's talk a little bit about the, the cones. Right? So the cones are basically what allow you to perceive color. Okay? And there are three basic kinds of cones. So cones enable color perception. And there are basically three types. There's, you know, technically they're called like long, medium, and short based on kind of their wavelength. So the long is sensitive to, you know, what I would call, you know, red, green, blue, like this. But as we'll see in just a second, you know, this red is actually, you know, more like a kind of a, yellowish green and this is this green is kind of more of a you know greenish blue and this blue is more like a bluish purple so if i if i go to this picture these are actually the responses of the long, medium, and short cones. So you can see that it's not like the long cones are peaking in the hardcore red region of the visual spectrum. The peak is really more in this kind of yellowy green range, right? It's sensitive, you know, the long ones are the really the only ones that are, that are super sensitive to reddish stuff, but the, the peak of the response is not close to red. And actually the long and the medium cones have pretty similar, you know, similar spectral responses. The, the medium is a little skewed towards green, and the small ones are definitely skewed towards blue, right? So that's the way it actually kind of works inside your eye. Um, and the proportions of these are actually also different, right? So it's not like you have a third of each kind of cone. You have lots of these reddish cones. You have, you know, again, lots of these green cones, and you have very few of these small cones. The ratio for each person between the long and the medium cones that they have varies quite a bit. So these are just kind of ballpark numbers. Um, so you might think, oh, well, how do we even see blue at all? Well, it turns out that these small cones are the most sensitive ones. So there's a trade-off between how many you have and how sensitive they are. And so your eye is really the most sensitive to greenish light. And so, um, there are some interesting facts about, about color and cones, right? So one of them is that these cones, the, the long and the medium cones, are coded on the X chromosome, okay? So basically, um, you know, we know that women have double X chromosomes and men have XY chromosomes, right? And so that means that um, if something goes wrong with the X chromosome, it's much, much more likely to happen to a man than to a woman. So that's where color blindness comes from. So color blindness is when you're not able to distinguish between these two types of cones. And so basically, um, one of the most common problems with color blindness is a problem with these medium cones. That means that you have a different, you have a problem kind of distinguishing between red and yellow and green, okay? And so 5% um, of males are apparently susceptible to this kind of color blindness, whereas basically, women are basically never colorblind. Uh, in fact, there are studies that show that women actually have, uh, may have more cones. They may have four different kinds of cones. It means that they may have kind of enhanced color perception than men, okay? Um, so that's kind of interesting. And um, another thing to think about is that different animals have different kinds of cones, right? So, um, you know, whales and dolphins can only see in basically, you know, one color. Uh, mammals, like cats and dogs, maybe can see in two colors, and fish and birds can see in four or five colors. And so the idea is that those different animals are seeing the world differently than you, right? So for example, what looks to you like two similar red flowers may look to a bird like two very different colors, right? One may be much more appealing than the other one, right? So um, 
so it's very interesting stuff. And and the reason they can tell how, how do they tell how many cones you know different things have? They take animal eyes, they put them in a centrifuge, and they see you know which which different color cones uh, come out to the edges. So um, so yeah, it's actually you know it really makes you think about the way that you perceive the world, right? And the way that you talk about color to other people, right? So I mean um, you know when you talk about green and blue to your friends, maybe they're not really seeing the same color, right? Um, there was nothing I wanted to say about that. Certainly there's a lot of also, I mean, it's not really related to the visual system, but there's also a lot of cultural color difference, right? So for example, in Japan, they call green traffic lights with the word that you would use for blue, right? So there's kind of like, if you say, oh, that thing is green, someone would say, no, that thing is blue, right? So again, everything is tied up with your visual system, with your brain, with culture. So it's, it's, all, it's a pretty interesting stuff. Um, okay, so all this should hopefully convince you that there really is no single, like, this is red, this is green, this is blue, right? But for the purposes of being able to talk about color in a scientific way at all, uh, there have been basically these commissions on color and illumination that have laid down some standards. And so there's a uh, CIE, which is a French abbreviation, I don't remember what it stands for, something like you know, Committee on you know, Illumination or something. Uh, so they set the standard that when we talk about red, like for a you know, scientific reason, you know, that we talk about red at 700 nanometers, green at 546 nanometers, sorry, that's the wavelength, and blue at 436 nanometers. And these are called basically the standard primary colors. And so image acquisition devices like cameras and image reproduction devices like TVs and computer monitors are basically trying to capture and combine these, uh, you know, responses and emissions of these primitive colors, right? And so, you know, that's why hopefully the TVs all agree on what color should red, what color should green, what color should blue be, right? Uh, that may not always be true. I remember that certainly on old analog TVs there was like this tint button that you had to use to kind of get the color to look like the way that it should, right? These days, Hopefully, you don't have to do a lot of adjustment on your digital TV that you buy from Best Buy to get the colors to look the same on all the TVs. Although, if you go to you know again, if you go to get, if you go to Best Buy and you look at the range of TVs, there's definitely color differences as you look at this big display of screens, right? So it's tough to really get right down to these things. Um, and so again, we can attempt to combine these emissions of these primitive colors to get all the colors that we want, right? So. Here's an example of a little LED gadget that I bought a long time ago where it basically just has red, green, and blue uh, LEDs in it, and you put it on your wall, and it washes the wall in what seems to be oranges and yellows and purples, right? As you can see, there's really only red, green, and blue here. Um, this is a cheesy device, so I'm just going to be that impressed by it. Um, right? And it tends to produce white by combining red, green, and blue at the same time, right? Now, in theory, that should work. But in practice, um, you want to have some sort of dedicated white. And I'll talk about this in just a second, because actually a lot of the stuff that we do in the um, Smart Lighting Center here at RPI is based on uh, colors and perception and so on. So I'll do a little pitch for that at the end of the lecture here. And if any of you are interested in like this kind of general topic, we should have you know, plenty of URP positions this semester if people are interested in learning more and doing more with, with colored lights. And so again, you guys are probably familiar with this kind of combination of, you know, if I combine red light and green light, I should perceive yellow. If I combine red light and blue light, I should perceive what's called magenta. If I combine green and blue, I should get cyan. And if I combine them all, I should get white. And so in terms of um, MATLAB, for example, so MATLAB is going to represent a digital image with every pixel has an RGB value, right? And so in MATLAB, red will be something like this, right? And yellow will be red plus green, and white will be all these things on at once, right? On a scale of 0 to 1. Sometimes MATLAB uses 0 to 255. We'll talk about that you know, as we get our hands dirty with MATLAB. But in general, on a normalized scale, this is how it would work. So on the other hand, you know, one other thing to remember is that this is how light is combined, but things are different when you talk about how 
ink and printing is combined. So let's just talk about that for just a second. So uh, you may have also heard of like the CMYK color space. So what does that mean? So uh, that's called the subtractive color space. And so this basically works because, um, you know, when you look at something that's red on, you know, on a page, it's not like there's red light shining out of that object, right? What's happening is that ambient light, white light, is coming in, and what's getting reflected back to your eye is red. And so in practice, for example, what's happening is, let's say I have a, you know, a patch of cyan, you know, paint on a piece of paper, right? So this is like pigment or ink, right? So what happens is that, assuming that the incoming light is white, so red, green, blue light is coming in, the cyan paint is sucking up the red light and transmitting out just the green and the blue, right? And so. This is what's called a subtractive color model, because instead of combining different pigments, we're actually taking incoming light and removing different colors from it, right? And so the subtractive model is something like this, where I have these inks that are cyan and magenta and yellow. And if I put uh, cyan and yellow together, what shows is green. If I put cyan and magenta together, I get blue. And if I put magenta and yellow together, I get red. And then if I put all three of them together, I should get black. I guess I'm using, this is like the MATLAB abbreviation. This is black. Wow. Right? And so, uh, wow. So basically, if I want to print red, what I should do is I should superimpose blotches of magenta and yellow ink, right? And that, what, that, will, that will be what looks red to you. Um, so in theory, if we wanted to print black, what we should do is we should put cyan, magenta and yellow on top of each other, and that should look like black. But in practice, because of you know the way that physical ink combines, that generally looks like a kind of a crummy black, not like the deep black. So typically what you'll see in a printer is you've got to replace the CMY and then the black isolated cartridge. So if you have to print black on your printer, it will be using the dedicated black cartridge, not trying to combine the colors to produce some sort of a crummy black. So that's kind of what's called true black, right, is this, is this K cartridge. And that's where four color printing comes from. Okay, so other things related to color. Okay, so there are some words that you may have heard related to color. Let's talk about those for a second. So, um, color terms. So there's a there's a term that's called like brightness, or intensity, or value. And that kind of corresponds to the kind of uh, notion of how much light there is. How bright the light is, how intense the light is. Hue is basically related to the dominant color. You know, is it greenish, is it reddish, is it purplish? And saturation is related to kind of what I would call like the purity or the strength of the color. Kind of the difference between a pastel and, you know, like a like kind of a kind of like the tint of a color. So basically, the lower the saturation is, the paler the color seems to be. And so this kind of all turns into like you may have seen like this kind of color wheel description of, of colors. So like if you look at something like uh, Photoshop, you know they'll give you a way of picking a color. Either you can pick out of an RGB palette or you can pick out of like a, for example, a hue saturation value palette where you're selecting the color. Sometimes you'll see it as the going around a circle, you get different colors. And then as you go from the middle to the outside, it goes from paler to more saturated with kind of white being in the middle. And then as you go from the bottom of value to the top of the value, it's kind of like the, the you know, amount of that color that there is, right? So this HSV, you know, color space is very common for, um, you know, switching back and forth between RGB and HSV. It's something that if you're a, a Photoshop guy or a graphic designer, you're probably doing that all the time. Okay, so together, um, 
the hue and the saturation define what's called the chromaticity of a color, right? So the value is only kind of about uh, the, the intensity of the color. It's kind of like saying, if I were to turn this image to grayscale, the brightness from black to white of that pixel would be the value, right? All the color information is coded in the hue and saturation together. So generally, you want to have one number that tells you the kind of overall intensity and two numbers that tell you where in color space you are. Okay, so basically, you know, hue plus saturation define the chromaticity. Okay. And basically, the amounts of red, green, and blue that you have to add up to get a given color, given these primaries, right? So basically, the, the CIE, this color organization, defined these curves that define the kind of reference spectra for red, green, and blue. And so if I wanted to make a new color, I basically have to tell you, you know, what combination of these reference spectra do you need, right? So it's basically like a linear combination of you know, 0.5 of this plus 0.3 of that plus 0.2 of that gives you the color that you're trying to make. And so basically um, the amounts of the reference CIE primaries needed to form a color are called the tristimulus values. And sometimes you see these called capital X, capital Y, capital Z. And then we characterize a color by basically, you know, the fraction of each. And so that kind of leads to, so let me just say for a second, so how do we get something like this x, right? This is a number. And the way it really works is it's like saying, okay, I get x by integrating the spectral power distribution of the, of the color given the wavelength, right? So this is basically like the spectral power distribution. I multiply that by the color matching function. So basically this is kind of like, you know, the color matching function. That may, for example, define what is the official red, right? And then I integrate, basically I have the, the official red and I have my color and I multiply these two things together and I integrate and I get a number and that number tells me basically how much red is there in this color. And so if you kind of do that, you get what's called this chromaticity diagram. Okay, so I don't know if any of you have ever seen this picture before, but this is basically saying, okay, you know, these are, this is a kind of a plot as a function of x, the amount of red, and y, the amount of green in terms of these primaries, all the colors that humans are able to see. Okay, now this is just a representation in a sketchy space, right? Obviously, you know, um, it's not like you can reproduce all the colors that you as a human can see on this one picture. It's just a sketch of the, the range or the gamut, it's called, of, of, you know, the human vision system. Okay, and so you can only get at a certain fraction of these colors with any given device, right? So for example, if I have uh, an LCD monitor that has given, you know, given red phosphors, green phosphors, and blue phosphors, then the only thing that I can do is I can combine different amounts of those phosphors up to as much as the monitor can go, right? And so that means that for any given three emission, you know, three channel emission system, I can only get at some, you know, triangle inside what the human visual system is able to perceive, right? And so it's definitely true that you can't uh, see on a monitor every color you can see in the real world, right? Because the monitor, number one, 
can't go infinitely bright. Uh, number two, you know, even if I were to pull the screen all the way out to here, there would still be some colors that are not combinable directly by these three numbers. I maybe need some extra, you know, I, I can't project the real world color onto this linear combination of three primaries exactly, right? There's still some, some stuff left over. And furthermore, I can't print everything that I can see on my monitor, right? Because inks are different than phosphors. And so, if, again, if you're like a graphic designer, you're always struggling with the situation of how do I show the client something on my TV screen or my computer monitor and then print it in such a way that I can be sure that they see what I want, right? And so certainly, um, you know, this was a big issue, so I, I wrote a book, right? And so I've got all these figures on my screen that look great, right? And then I want to send them to the printer, and of course, they have to get converted from RGB color space to CMYK color space, and it could be that that conversion is not exact, right? So suddenly this, you know, beautiful green, I, I definitely had a problem with the greens because, like, what looked like a very nice green on my screen turned into this, like, yellowish green on the page that I really didn't like. And so I had to choose a different CMYK color for what I wanted to be green in the book, right? And so this kind of conversion back and forth, again, is, is endemic to, you know, print production, right? And so if you're a Photoshop user or an Illustrator user, you'll see that, for example, it will ask you what color mode do you want this document to be in. And if you're, if you're going to print it eventually anyway, then you probably want to select CMYK from the beginning so that you're sure that what you are fooling around with on your screen is a good approximation of what you're going to see on the page. Um, yeah, so the whole thing is, is more complicated than you might think at the very beginning. Um, so let me say a little more about that. So I'm kind of touching on different color spaces, right? And so we kind of talked about different ways of representing color. There's the RGB method, and this is what MATLAB will use. There's, you know, CMYK, which is kind of what, um, you know, Photoshop or something like that will use. Um, then there's like hue saturation value. We showed that little cylinder with the colors. So uh, related to that, there's a whole bunch of related things like hue saturation intensity, which is a little bit different than that, that are, you know, in theory, a little bit better at describing the color, right? So I mean, you can look at a hue saturation value triplet and kind of interpret that saying, oh, this is a pale pink, right? You can kind of read that off from the H and the S and the V. So in some sense, it's a little bit more um, intuitive for you know, people who care about color words in some sense. And so um, kind of related to some of this, right? So there's definitely like, you know, you may have heard of like web safe colors. So it used to be that um, back in the day, especially when there were like, you know, uh, people didn't have like great resolution monitors and monitors are not as good as they are today, you know, so I can represent RGB. So if you're if you're a HTML programmer, right, you know that most RGB is represented as a hex triplet like this. So I have like RGB. And so if I have nothing in each of these things, this is black. And if I go all the way up to 255 in each of these things, I get uh, white. I guess these are FFs. And so usually, you know, if you're if you're programming your background or your web page, you need to know what the hex code for the color is that you want. Uh, and then the web safe colors are basically in each of these slots. You have to have, you know, one of these, you know, six colors. So basically, you only get six levels of red, six levels of green, and six levels of blue. So there are 216 web safe colors that you know if you have like even just like the crudest color palette that you have in like. Microsoft Paint is probably going to be like the web safe colors, right? And I remember back in Windows 3.1 where there were really only like 16 colors like that. Like there was something where you only had like, you know, 16 colors to play with. You know, you guys don't know how lucky you are. So, um, so there's a problem on the homework about kind of like color conversion. And so um, there are equations for going back and forth. And one of the problems in the homework is basically I give you an RGB color and I ask you to turn it into you know, the CMY color space and the HSI color space. And so the details of how to do that are, um, so going from RGB to CMY is really easy. Basically, you're just subtracting numbers. Um, whereas converting RGB to like hue saturation value, 
there is a little bit of an equation to follow. We have to figure out what is the angle that corresponds to this, you know, position around the cylinder, right? But it's not hard to, to make that work. Um, okay. So let me just say a couple words about um, what we're doing at RPI. So this is actually, uh, again, as a pitch for getting people involved in undergraduate research. So we have this new smart conference room over in the CII on the seventh floor that we have installed both um, kind of advanced uh, multicolor lights. So these, basic, these lights basically have five color channels, white, red, green, blue, amber, right? And so basically, we can individually address these colors for each of these lights and combine them. Um, and also we have these custom built color sensors, which are these black dots in the ceiling that you can't really see, that are also sensitive. I believe these are just sensitive to RGB white, but we're looking to get more sensitive sensors like six channel or eight channel color sensitive things. So we built these ourselves from parts, but we're definitely looking to, to improve them. And the idea that we want to do here is we want to control the human comfort and productivity and happiness in the room, right? So here's an example, kind of hard to see here. I guess I don't know if I have the video here. Um, I, I could look for it, but let me just keep on talking for a second. So basically, what's happening here is that, you know, when you go into a typical room like this, I only have a few color, or I only have a few uh, light presets, right? I can have everything on, everything dim, everything off, right? Whereas if there was a window in this room, it would make sense that the room should not be pumping more light into a region of the room where there's already light coming in. And so what you see here, it's not very dramatic, but what's happened is that we've opened this window and these lights are automatically using a control algorithm deciding to dim down because they don't need to be pushing light into this part of the room where there's already sunlight coming through the window. And so if you were to watch a time lapse of sun going through the room, you would see that the lights closer to the windows are dimming down substantially you know, not wasting energy is, is one primary reason we want to do this. And then when night comes back, they kind of come up back to a set point where all the, all the lights look basically the same intensity. Not only are they changing uh, intensity, but you can also see that these guys have kind of a, a more greenish hue. So they're actually also changing color because what we're trying to do is maintain a certain color set point in the room, okay? And so, again, we've got a bunch of students who are working on different aspects of, um, you know, color control inside this room. And the kinds of skills that you need are, you know, mostly, I mean, so up at the ceiling of this room are lots of, you know, lots of wiring, lots of uh, Raspberry Pis that are controlling what's going on with all these uh, different sensors and lights. Um, and so really it's a good URP for somebody who is kind of hands-on, wants to do kind of like Raspberry Pi and Arduino programming, wants to troubleshoot hardware kind of stuff, but also wants to do it in the service of making the room useful for human use, right? And so um, if you're interested in these kinds of research problems, please come and see me and we can set you up with a URP. Um, here's an example of the kinds of things you can do in the room, which is kind of interesting. So basically, since you have five channels in the room, you can, so here's another kind of freaky visual system thing, right? So basically, you only have these three kinds of cones in your eye, right? So that means that in theory, you could have different ambient color that is perceived by you to be the same color value, right? Because really what you're doing is you're, you know, this is kind of like what's happening in your eye, right? You have the, I'll draw it again. So you kind of have like the incoming color distribution, and then you have the response of one of the primaries in your eye, and the integral between this and that gives you just some number, right? And so, Really, sorry, I should have used different color ink here. So basically what you have is like the, you know, the three cones, and then you have this thing. Right, so even though the true color is this complicated spectral combination, right, really what you're getting in your visual system are three numbers. They're like the projections of that complicated thing onto the spectral responses of your cones, right? And so that means that there can be lots of different colors, infinitely many colors in the world that you perceive to be the same way. And so we exercise that in a cool way in the smart conference room where basically if you look at the ceiling, the lights appear to be exactly the same color to you, right? So we have basically two states where we toggle back and forth 
what this five channel light fixture is doing, you perceive the lights to be the same, okay? But that light is reflecting off of objects in the room very differently. And so that means that after that five, after that light bounces off of stuff in the room and comes back to your eyes, the stuff that's on the ground and on the table can look very different to you, right? So the light looks the same, but the objects look different. So this is like a difference between a very dulled uh, environment and a very saturated environment. So like, it's very striking to be in the room, especially with something like, you know, a tomato or, uh, you know, this, this really works best in the red channel. So, uh, and actually they use this in, uh, you know, kind of high-end grocery stores, right? They will take, you know, some sort of spectrum of LED light and put it in the grocery case, right? So that the tomatoes and so on look appealing. And then you get it home, you're like, why did I buy this crappy tomato, right? But, but in practice, you know, that's being used all the time, not just for, yeah, it's used all over retail, actually. You know, like we're talking to things like department stores for how do you make your store seem more appealing, right? So like I said, I invite you to come over to the conference room. Maybe one day we can do a field trip over here and you can see how this works, right? Because it is really very weird, right? To imagine that, you know, you don't see anything different, but then you look at the table and these things are like flickering on and off. It's even more freaky when you kind of have a, a smooth ramp between the color states and then the things on the table look like they're kind of pulsing, you know, pulsing red, right? It's pretty cool. Um, and also related to this is that um, we have a whole uh, plant, uh, kind of plant and color related project in the Smart Lighting Center where basically, um, you know, it turns out that plants respond very differently than humans to light, right? So, so some of you may have, have parents who have like, uh, I don't want to say it's the wrong way, not grow lights, but you know, like the, uh, you know, the, the kind of weird purplish light that you can use to start seeds in the basement before, you know, the end of winter. And plants like that kind of light, right? And so one of the things we're doing in the ERC is experimenting with, you know, kind of, you know, what color light do plants like the best? And it turns out that you can actually very, you know, I don't know, so we have, we have a, you know, an expert in the ERC on this, I shouldn't say too much, that's not correct. But, you know, it turns out that you can, I think, do some pretty fine control of, if you schedule how the lights work, you can kind of schedule what the plants are doing, right? And so, again, that's a very interesting and very cool application of, of light. So, if you're saying that stuff, please, uh, you know, contact me and we can talk about possible URP stuff. Okay, so I, I guess I kind of talked more than usual. So, any questions about anything? Light, color, perception, yep. In uh, MATLAB, there's, uh, there's RGB, there's also ARGB. What exactly is that? There's ARGB Thanks. in MATLAB? That I don't know. I mean, I guess we could. Yeah. Oh, alpha. Okay, so that's probably, um, let's see. Let's just take a look for a second. So yeah, actually, while we're here, let's just take a look at how MATLAB deals with color. Um, okay. First, I have to find an image that is not, like, fully embarrassing. Okay. So we'll talk about this a little more next time, but while we're here, so let's talk about, you know, reading images. And so if I read in an image, like this one that has the um, spectrum, okay. So this is an image that is 685 rows, 1,208 columns, and three color channels, okay? So probably most of the stuff that you've worked in MATLAB so far has only been like two-dimensional matrices, but in this class we'll deal a lot with three-dimensional matrices, okay? And so here you can see that this is what's called an unsigned 8-bit integer, uint8, okay? And so if I look, for example, at, um, so I can use imshow to look at this image. And then if I want to uh, pick something off of it, let's just say, um, Let me get a, grab a point off of this image. So let's grab this point here. So this is a little bit confusing in some sense because um, we're going to talk about this more when we start talking about MATLAB assignments. But there's kind of a there's kind of a disconnect between how you think of an image and how MATLAB thinks of an image, right? So one of the problems I don't want to get ahead of myself is that you know if you were to talk about pixels in the image, you would probably talk about you know, 
x you know, in this direction and y in this direction, right? So if I said the 200 comma 300 pixel, you would probably say, okay, I'm gonna count down 200 and go over 300, right? But that's actually very different than the uh, way that we talk about coordinates in uh, the math world, right? So for example, um, did I close my camera? I guess I did. So, you know, so I guess that I would call this the difference between image and Cartesian coordinates, right? So in image coordinates, you would kind of say, okay, this is the direction of increasing x, and this is the direction of increasing y. So like if I said, you know, 200 comma 300, you would say, okay, I'm gonna go down this way and go over this way, right? Whereas, you know, the world of the x, y axis in calculus is very different, right? You know, x goes in the left-right direction, y goes in the up-down direction. So in MATLAB, you sometimes have to do some mental gymnastics to make sure you're asking for the right thing. So for example, this g input command I just asked for, I believe, is always going to give me something that is in Cartesian coordinates, right? Because it's just thinking about this as a, you know, Cartesian grid. And so what I want to do now is just say, okay, I'm going to take my point. So let's say um, I want to find out what color was at that point. So I have to flop these around. And I'm saying, give me all the colors, all the color channels at that point. So that gave me 238, 239, 89, right? So I'll just write this like this. So what this tells me is I've got a lot of red, a lot of green, and not much blue, and that makes sense because what I clicked on was, um, you know, somewhere in this yellow range, right? Now, you'll notice that these um, entries are all integers in the range of 0 to 255, okay? And that's fine, uh, but unfortunately, these uint8 uh, matrices sometimes don't um, Okay, so so let's let's just kind of like do a quick example of making an image, right? So if I want to just make an intensity image, what I could do is say, okay, here I'm going to make an image that is um, well. Here, let's let's think about how MATLAB works for a second. So suppose I want to make an image that is stripy like this, okay. So it starts here at black, and it goes down here to white, right? So what I could do is I could say, okay, I want, that means that this should be zero, like a row of zeros, and this should be a row of 255s, right? And so I could use a for loop to do this, but I like to use for loops. And so what I could do instead is say, okay, what I really want to do is take a vector that goes from zero to 255, and multiply it by a constant row vector of ones, right? So this is a 256 by one vector. This is a one by 256 vector. What I get out is gonna be a 256 by 256 vector that is gonna have constant rows. So let's just take a look at that. So I can say I'm gonna take this guy times ones uh, one comma 256 vector. So when I do that, now I have a 256 by 256 image, and if I look at this image, let's see what happens. So that looks wrong, right? So why does it look wrong? Well, one of the reasons is that um, this imshow command doesn't always know what kind of image you're giving it, right? Um, if you tell it imshow the image with curly braces, what that says is, I want you to scale the darkest color in this image to black and the whitest colors in this image to white. If you do that, then you get something that is more like what you expect, okay? And even here, this is kind of an interesting, this is not exactly mock bands, this is kind of another example of perception, right? So like, if you were to look at this image, you might not think that this was like a constant, you know, ramp, right? It seems like there's somehow, you know, too much white or too much black or something like that. It doesn't look even, right? Again, that's kind of like, again, this 
physical perception of how intensity is mapped kind of logarithmically into your human visual system. Okay. So one of the homework problems is to generate a bunch of different MATLAB um, images. And so suppose I wanted to generate a color image, right? So what I could do is say, okay, now instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another channel to this image, right? So I could say my second image channel, suppose that now I'm going to do this. This is a little tricky. So what will this do? So here, I'm switching around the I'm switching around the order of these uh, elements, and I'm assigning that new thing to the blue channel. Okay, so if I do that, now what I have is a 256 by 256 by three image, where the green channel is all zero, the red channel is this top to bottom ramp, and the blue channel is this kind of left to right ramp. And let's see what happens if I look at that image now. Again, looks kind of weird, and I think the reason for this is that this is kind of like one of these MATLAB things. So I'm going to turn this back into an 8-bit integer, and now I get an image that looks like this, right? So here, this is like saying that the red channel is going from uh, no red to all red, and the blue channel is going from no blue to all blue, and then I get this kind of color wash in the middle. Okay. So again, I should let you guys go, but basic idea is that you know, when you use uint8, you're basically turning the variable into a 8-bit integer on the range of 0 to 256. Okay? An image show will always know what to do with that. Right? If the image is like a floating point thing, so like normally MATLAB variables are double. right? And so this image show command doesn't always know what to do with double images. And so it's always, you know, it, if you're using a color image, you may want to cast it back to UN8 before you show it. We'll talk a lot more about this as we get actually into some of the MATLAB stuff. But since you're going to be doing some image creation, you may run up against some of these issues. Um, another reason that UN8 is a little bit tricky is that let's suppose that I have like um, two numbers, like uh, say I take you know UN8 100 plus UN8 um, 200. Right? If I do that, I get 255, right? Because this is like treating the integers as saturating at 255, right? So arithmetic on UN dates is not what you would expect for arithmetic on doubles. And so whenever you want to do image manipulation involving kind of additions and subtractions and multiplications and divisions, for the most part, you should either be using internal MATLAB commands or casting the double before you do something. So we'll, we'll get into that later. Okay, so questions or comments? I guess I'd actually answer your question. Your, answer question. your question actually had to do with what is this ARGB? So it's also possible, especially in computer graphics, where you have an alpha channel. And the alpha channel basically says how transparent is this thing. So if you want to take uh, you know, an image and transparently overlay it on some other image, then I need a number that tells me how see-through is every pixel. And that's probably what that A is. But MATLAB does have a lot of, um, let's see. MATLAB has a ton of documentation, and I'm trying to find documentation. So what we were just talking about is kind of like color. I'm looking for the color. Here we go, color. So MATLAB does have a bunch of color transforms built into it, different color spaces, RGB to XYZ, RGB to this, you know, different things. And so, you know, we'll get to a point where we're going to be using those. For the purposes of the first assignment, I want you to convert RGB to HSV with, with the formula. You can check it, but just be aware that you know some programs have different, um, slightly different conversion formula than what's in the book. So just for my own edification, do it right the first time that we can use MATLAB. Okay. Other comments or questions? All right. So there is an assignment up on Piazza, um, and you should be able to get started on it uh, pretty quickly here. Um, so if we look at it, it's in the resources section, and so the first problem is asking you to make a bunch of different images, kind of similar to what we were just doing. Um, the next one we didn't really talk about, we'll talk about it over next time, has to do with 
um, you know, the number of gray levels or color levels in the image and how that affects your perception of it. You could probably get started on some of these. And then uh, the last one has to do with converting between color spaces. So this is due next week, Thursday. And the TA will have office hours on Wednesday afternoon if you have any questions. And by the time you're done with the, next, with the lecture on Monday, you should know everything that you need to be able to, to solve the problems. Okay. 